screen calm down. Yeah, now live. Yeah. Good afternoon. Yeah. Welcome yeah. to members of the committee, uh, to those presenting to the committee, and to any uh, members of the public or press who are watching what we've got, we're doing today. Uh, a few housekeeping issues. Mobile phones should be switched off unless you're using them for hearing the meeting. I remind members that they cannot leave the meeting during the presentation or debate on any application. If they leave the meeting, they'll be unable to vote on the application. Uh, can, you, can you mute your microphone? Can everyone mute the microphone, please? If for any reason you believe you didn't hear part of the debate, then please abstain when it comes to the vote for that particular item. I remind members of the public and local members that they're present purely to observe the process. If I lose connection, then Councillor Price as Vice Chairman will stand in until I regain connection to the meeting. If another member of the committee loses connection, I may decide to have a short adjournment in order for the member to attempt to leave. Uh, if we go through the time. We have We run. We run the timing system. The clock has a device that will indicate when your time is up. Individuals have five minutes to present unless they're sharing a slot, in which case they have two and a half minutes each. My. Chair, I, I appear to chair, my chair, Council, this service is cutting in and out on me today. Teams are just getting appalling for me, to be frank. I don't know if I'm going to be able to participate in this meeting. I feel like I'm being excluded from participation in this committee. But why is teams deteriorating so much from County Hall? I've had Zoom meetings all day long that have worked no problem whatsoever, but Teams is rubbish. Uh, I will pick that up with officers outside of this meeting. Uh, so I'm excluded from that? this meeting. I can hardly hear you. Is it just you or is it everyone? The mother's here. Um, yeah. Chair, I find it easy. I've just put the um, my headphones on. I can hear you fine, but I couldn't hear you without them. Okay, I'm trying to get closer to my, my uh, we're, now, we're now at the position that we have uh, the timings for the meeting. Uh, so everyone gets five minutes unless the, uh, they're sharing a slot, in which case they get two and a half minutes each. Um, I now ask the councillors of the committee uh, to switch the microphones on in turn and introduce themselves. Councillor Beston. Uh, yeah, sorry, Chair. Good afternoon. Uh, Councillor Beston, Shanklin Central Ward. Councillor Brodie. Councillor Brodie, Newport East, but protesting that this meeting isn't really running effectively for a participant to take part. 
Councillor Cameron. Good afternoon, Chairman. Councillor Cameron, Freshwater North, attending this meeting. Councillor Fuller. Young Mooch. Councillor Fuller um, from Cows West and Gurnard. Again, I'm having problems with my reception as well. It, it, I agree with Councillor Brodie. The reception is absolutely rubbish compared to Zoom. Um, and I don't really want to have to dip out because I can't hear everything. Um, I may have to come back and ask people to re repeat what they say if necessary. Thank you. Councillor Hastings. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Steve Hastings, member for Central White. Councillor Hollis. Uh, Councillor Hollis, uh, member for Newport West. Councillor Howe. Um, Councillor for Totland. And I apologise for the background, Chairman, but it won't allow me to change the background, I'm afraid. Very attractive background. That's acceptable. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Jones Evans. Good afternoon, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Julie Jones Evans, Newport Central. I'm going to turn my video off, though, Chair, if I may, so that will maybe help the, the frequency width. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kilpatrick. Good afternoon, Chair. Councillor John Kilpatrick, Bin Seven, Fishbourne. Councillor Price. Good afternoon, Chairman. Councillor Matt Price, Newport North, including Whippingham South. I'm Vice Chairman of the Planning Committee. I do apologise, I can't apply a virtual or corporate background, I'm afraid. My um, hardware, for some reason, just won't let me do it today. So I do apologise. Councillor Tyndall. Uh, yeah, Councillor Tyndall, Brady St Helens and Benbridge, and likewise with the background, can't change it. You just have put up with the, uh, the, the scene of uh, Rive Seafront without Win Wayne Windle getting put, coming in. And I'm Councillor Quirk, Chairman of the Committee. We now move on to the agenda. Uh, minutes. Uh, can you please advise me if there are any issues with the minutes from the last meeting? Uh, I, I propose them, Chair. Sorry. Okay. I, I did put through an amendment and I think Marie's done the amendment I asked for. OK, thank you. Uh, so we've got a proposal, a seconder. Um, Councillor Beston, proposed by Councillor Jones Evans, seconded by Councillor Beston. Uh, is everyone happy with the, the minutes? Uh, the minutes are approved. Yes, Chair. Uh, declarations of interest. Uh, members are asked to notify the clerk in advance of today's meeting to advise of any declarations of interest. Uh, Councillor, if you believe you have an interest that you have not pre notified to the clerk, please indicate such by the chat set function now. OK, I'll do that. Uh, Clark, can you read out any of the declarations that you've received? I've not been notified of any, Chairman. Excuse me, Chair. I'm trying to do the chat room and it's not to, it's I'll do it now verbally, if I may. I am a cabinet member for corporate resources, which obviously on the first item is a, a Isle of Wight uh, property. It won't affect my decision on that at all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we move on to public question time. Oh, chair, sorry, I've put in the chat box. I've got, I've got a, I've got one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I've got interest. Yeah, my declaration of interest, chairman, is that I, I know the applicant on the first item. Okay. That's a non, non pecuniary interest. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have um, any chair, chairman? Um, also, I'm I'm adding something to the um, chat bar, but it's get proceeding. The meeting's proceeding quicker than I can type. Um, I'm a member of the Isle of Wight Council's AONV partnership, um, who is based at Branston Farm, um, and so I have a non-pecuniary interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. No more declarations of interest. If we then move on to public question time, are there any questions from the public? I've not been notified of any, Chair. OK, thank you very much. We move on to the agenda. Agenda item four, planning applications. 
the, the first application is reference number 20 oblique 01160 oblique FUL, Branson Farm Study Centre, Branson New Church. Um, can I ask the officer to present? Yes, evening members. Um, I will just open the uh, the presentation. Give me one minute because it is a little bit slow tonight. Chairman, can you just confirm that um, you can see the PowerPoint slide for me, please? Uh, yes, I certainly can. Lovely, that's good. So um, if anyone can't, just put it in the chat bar, but um, I've shared it and hopefully it's <laughs> it's all opened. Right, so the application site um, is Branston Farm, um, the, the former education centre that um, I, I'm sure everyone Chair, is sorry, could I interrupt? Of. Chair, sorry, could I interrupt? This We're going to have to get this sorted. I have no access to the chat bar. People are using a chat bar separate from what the public can see. I have no access to it. This meeting is becoming an absolute disgrace in terms of accountability to the island. We need to to pers to adjourn it and get this sorted out. I'm pleading with you. Uh, I think, Councillor Brody, you'll find that if you use the council equipment, then you might be able to access it. They don't provide me with council equipment. That's, in, that's entirely an appropriate comment. Well, it's it, how many people cannot see the uh, the chat bar? It does seem to be specific to you, Councillor Bodie, and it does seem to be the right. I, I'm going to withdraw from this meeting, but I do feel I'm being discriminated against by this council as per usual. That's your right, but I disagree with the fact that you uh, are being discriminated against. I think it's yourself that uh, puts you in that position. Uh, if we can go on then to the presentation. Thank you, Chairman. So, uh, yeah, the application site uh, is located about 1.9 kilometres, about two kilometres um, to the southeast of Ariton um, at the point of the cursor now where it says Branston on the slide. Um, the, the site area is about 5.2 hectares, although the area to be developed um, is about 1.8. That's the residential part and obviously the, the proposed business park, which I'll show you in a moment, is, is on a brownfield section of the land. Um, so, so the application is just to the north of Hale Common. So I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, I don't know if someone's just changed something. Um, so it's just so it's to the just north, north of Hale Common, Hale Common. Um, um, close to Hollier's farm turn the point to the cursor. Um, as you'll see at the point of the, thank you chairman, that's much better. Uh, at the point of the cursor now is the crossroads um, at Hale Common between Mortree Lane um, and Hale Common itself near the greenhouses and the fighting cocks and off to the east of the site is the crossroads between Prince Lit Chute, uh, Winford Road uh, and Hale Common. So just moving on to the site boundary, as I said, it's about 5.2 hectares. The application site is uh, the area shown in red. Um, what members will note is the remainder of the land holding, Branston Farm is shown in the blue line uh, as well. Um, and helpfully the, the plan there shows the, the consented brewery that was considered by the committee in, I think, September. Um, in addition, the blue line extends along a section of the highway and I'll show you an updated plan of that later on, um, relate, which relates to an additional footpath link. So just some photographs of the existing site then. Um, most members probably will be aware of it or have driven past it, but it's a collection of relatively modest farm buildings that were used as part of the former education centre, which is closed. Um, including a range of open fronted livestock barns, then more typical sort of storage sheds uh, and hay barns 
uh, in the site. Um, so the site frontage from the road is um, the back of one of the open fronted barns. Then going into the site, a collection in a sort of an E shape, if you like, of buildings. Um, the bottom left hand corner photograph is a picture of an existing classroom there. Um, that is now the building used by the AONB partnership and that isn't proposed to be demolished as part of this development and the partnership will remain in there alongside the the, the sort of mobile classroom there which they use as their, their sort of main public meeting room. And then off to the side of that you'll see past this tree here the remainder of the site um, at the field just to the north. Moving on then just a, um, some photographs of the highway close to the point of the access. Um, showing views to the west and then off to the east towards Princeless Chute. Um, and then just some internal photographs of the field at the site. So the arrows just show where I was stood when I took those, those photographs. So the, the top um, left hand side photograph is taken from the field um, just to the west of the farm group, um, looking towards wayside cottages here, some existing properties near to the site. Um, then looking from the, the site boundary here uh, across to the road, these poplar trees align the highway just here. That's the highway hedge. Um, and then this photograph here taken from the point of the arrow here, looking up towards this area of cops. Um, winter picture obviously, so the trees aren't in leaf. And then some further photographs just taken um, near to wayside cottages here, looking towards uh, this internal hedgerow here. Um, which is just here in the power lines next to it. And then the next photograph is taken on the other side of that hedgerow, looking towards this line of poplar trees here at the back of uh, Springfield Nurseries in, in Winford Road, which is just here. Um, and then another photograph taken from a similar position, looking at the existing group of buildings there. And some photographs of properties near to the site. So. Um, the property in the top left hand corner is Stockman's Cottage, which is part of the application site owned by the council. Um, it's restricted for agricultural purposes. Um, and then slightly to the west of there is a pair of cottages here, Branston House and Holliers. Um, and then a photograph in the bottom um, right hand corner just showing the frontage of those properties onto the main road. And then the left hand bottom photograph shows the boundary of those properties next to the site. So if you look in this photograph in the top right hand corner as a reference point, you can see that sort of red cupinol stained gate there. And that's again in the photograph in the left hand bottom corner looking towards the buildings there. Um, and just for reference purposes, these are the properties which we've just looked at. Um, hopefully you can see my cursor sort of hanging around those. Branson House, Hollyers and, and Stockman's Cottage. And then off to the west of the site a wayside and Linfield pair of properties there and just next to the site on the other side of the road is um, is Hollier's farm former Isle of Wight College premises it's now sort of a retail farm group with Purbeck House um, and Hollier's house close to the site um, so the proposals for the site uh, split it in half residential development in the northern part which i'll show you in a moment i've split those plans just to make the site bigger um, and in the southern part the business center the existing access to the site will be shut and then a new road created uh, and a new junction onto the northern side of hell common leading into the site to serve both the business park and the residential proposals there would also be a right hand turn lane created um, at the point of the cursor here for traffic coming from Sandown, turning into the application site. Uh, and you can see the footpath there just extending off towards the fighting cocks there. So looking at the site in, in a whole, <clears throat> you can see that mix of residential development to the north. These fields here remain as open space, a parking area here close to the access, and then the, the business park, and in between um, some allotments there, Eight parking spaces in this in this parking area and a, and a sort of on-site little storage barn for that that um, allotment uh, and then the residential development split in two halves by um, an, a, a green corridor at the point of the cursor here so then just showing each section in, in slightly larger plan form you see there that the houses the proposed houses 42 of them all affordable houses arranged in this sort of farm 
yard court style. That, that, that's the approach that uh, the applicant have adopted, um, accessed off the main spine road. Um, and so in the bottom half of the site, you've got a range of properties. These smaller buildings in between the properties are open fronted barns, and that's where the parking would be located uh, to keep the parking away from the front of the properties. So most parking is provided in those small barns of up to sort of three parking bays or five parking bays between that amount. And there's just a little bit of parking um, off the road in a couple of places throughout the site. There's a mix of two, mainly two storey properties, semi detached and terraces, um, but there are a couple of bungalows on the site as well. So one at the point of the cursor here uh, and, a, and one here. So I've just shown some examples here of, of the proposed housing types. I have got them all in this PowerPoint. If members want to see them at the end of the presentation, just let me know. But I've just given a couple of examples just to show you how they might look. So these are the proposed um, a mix of the detached and, and the semi detached houses there. Um, so a mix of materials to be used, traditional brick, um, fortecrete stone or some alternative company, I suppose. Um, traditional slate or tiled roofs, um, very traditional um, casement style windows would be used um, for those properties, quite well arranged fenestration. Um, and then moving through to some of the sort of handed properties, I suppose you'd call them, where you've got uh, one property uh, alongside another in a kind of a T shape, just to show that how they would be designed and the, and the sort of materials that would be used there. So you can see the brick, the boarding uh, and, and the stone along with the state roofs there but as I say I've got other examples of the housing designs if you want to see them and just a you know a, a slightly different approach for these properties here up in the northern section of the site. Um, just some street scene depictions there to show how these properties would be arranged so a mix of bungalows, terraces, semi-detached, there are a couple of detached as well as you'll see at the point of the cursor um, and then you can see the sort of uh, barn style parking areas there with, with timber elevations and tiled roofs um, to try and give it a sort of an agricultural character. Um, and then just an example of how those those small parking barns would be arranged just there. And then just some helpful uh, depictions of how the site might look. Obviously always comes with a health warning because it is it is a it's a drawing, but um, I think it gives a very good uh, interpretation of how the site might look. So Boundary treatments have been very carefully designed through negotiations with officers so that there's not too much in the way of close boarded fencing in between those those public areas there. So it's a mix of hedges and, and then walls to give it some a better feel. You can see that sort of courtyard arrangement just to pay a bit of homage to to the sort of the, the style of farmyards in the in the local area. Um, going through the middle of the site here. Um, is this area of open space or, or a green corridor there? Um, obviously not shown planted up there. And then um, the proposed landscaping around the site. Now officers have advised in the report that um, the landscaping should be bolstered a little bit. Um, and obviously that will be covered by conditions. But that just shows the kind of mix of materials to be used through the site as well as the house types and how um, their sort of mass and form is broken up by joining houses and handed elevations, those sorts of things. And you can also see the proposed bungalows uh, in these in these as well. So this is one just showing how the site would look looking from the north towards the south main highway over here, um, existing properties and the business park here and then the houses uh, beyond to the north and then the areas of open space which are retained. Um, and then the business park then that um, that is um, formed by demolishing all the existing buildings at the site um, just to the north of the existing properties and then replacing them um, with more modern office buildings. Um, so you've got um, several units, six units in the southern section of the site, parking in between, the existing access closed uh, and a new access form through here, um, off of the main access road and then the northern units here. So you can see there the existing A and B unit buildings there retained for, for them to continue to use. Um, and then just here there's a there's a little storage barn off to the side um, for site users to use. And then obviously the parking spaces through there. 
Um, it's uh, just one thing to note is that the Stockman's Cottage, because it turns its back on the road and has always been related to the farm, will continue to have its access through the site. So when this access here is closed, the property will be accessed via this, this main section of the business park. So just some um, drawings showing the business units. They've been designed to reflect the sort the, the, the modest shed style buildings on Branston Farm itself as it exists. Um, and the, I'll show you another aerial depiction in the moment that will help. But um, the use of you know boarding and traditional materials again on this site. Um, you'll notice that the openings have des been designed on these slightly larger buildings. There's two of these slightly larger units have been designed to look like a barn style opening. So a sort of a freshing barn door, if you want to put it like that. And then these long narrow windows again to hop back to a sort of a barn style building. What you'll notice is that the elevations onto the fields um, contain very few windows. And that's why you, you will have seen just now there were roof lights on the elevations on the external parts of the buildings. And that's because there's very few windows onto the fields to try and keep that agricultural style because it, it is traditional that barns didn't have openings onto fields. Um, and you can see that in these elevations here on the northern units. Um, but again, that sort of barn style design um, and the massing broken up by joining the buildings to those larger elevations. So again, just another depiction of those buildings. You can see the site access um, just to give a, I suppose, a, a sense of arrival. Two larger barn style buildings here, either side the entrance and then dropping down to single storey, lower pitch roofs yeah, in these areas here. And then the building close to the road pretty much um, mimicking the size and design of the existing barn that you saw in those photographs earlier on and just showing that the site access would be closed. Um, and uh, again, another depiction of, of those um, buildings when you look at the site from the north. So these bits here are the existing buildings and these are the proposed new ones to form the business park uh, and then the site access through here. Um, this area of landscaping here off to the west is where officers have advised that the landscaping should be slightly enhanced, uh, bolstered um, to provide a little bit more softening to that section of the site because that is the key visual indicator as you will have seen in the officer report. Um, and then just um, a bit of detail on the proposed site access. You'd have seen that the Island Road, Island Road comments have raised some concerns about visibility with the site. Those issues have been balanced with the, the proposed um, delivery of affordable houses and linked business units. Um, but just to show that um, as shown in the report, the, the visibility requirements for the right hand turn lane obviously are enhanced as you reduce the amount of stacked vehicles coming into that site. And so as the officer report has said, you know, uh, even during the peak period, it, it, it's predicted there'll be about a car a minute going into that site. And so the likelihood of having nine vehicles stacked into that into that uh, lane is unlikely. So we've assessed it on the basis of an average of maybe three vehicles um, given vehicle movements along the highway at the AM peak. Um, and that would give a visibility of 110 metres, which is about 20 metres below um, the required 130 in this section of the highway. But um, obviously officers will answer any questions on those issues um, as we move forward through the presentation. Um, but ultimately the application is recommended for approval um, there will be a legal agreement to secure um, plan compliant 35% affordable housing. The remainder, given that this is a, an exception site, is tied down by HCA funding, which would secure, which would make sure there was 100% affordable on this site going forward. Um, and then there is also um, the requirement for the additional uh, transport link up towards um, up towards Watery Lane, and uh, also a £15,000 contribution towards. Uh, improving rights of way network in the local area. So it's recommended for conditional approval, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we move.
Uh, who's reading the statement? I am Chair Ollie Bolter. Thank you, Ollie. Go ahead. So the first statement is from Mr. Brake. I object to this ill-founded application. The area is not designated for any residential development, nor is it suitable even if linked with other types of premises. Potential residents of houses proposed will not find favour with living in what has been described as a rural business park. Do not be fooled by the appetisers of community allotments and a biodiversity park. The real intention is to create a new housing estate consisting of 42 homes, which is not acceptable in this rural environment. Some numbers of houses will generate the potential for at least 100 vehicles with service vehicles, in addition, which will cause much traffic congestion on the main road, which is a fast stretch where speed limits are frequently ignored. A new junction with existing with the existing access closed will create a serious traffic hazard with potential for accidents. Whilst I have no criticism of Goddard's Brewery, I consider that this part of the application should have been considered as part of the main application and not separately. Their vehicles are large lorries which would contribute to the traffic hazards turning from the main road into the area and emerging therefrom. This part of the island is essentially rural and should remain so. The visual impact of such homes and businesses would detract from the rural scene. An independent environmental impact assessment should be requested and submitted before the application falls for consideration. References to employment in any part of the application must be ignored as this is not a planning consideration. The references to affordable housing are a music hall joke. There is no such concept. The aim of developers is to make as much profit as possible with sales prices elevated accordingly. They do not care about islanders. Despite the propaganda being advanced in publicity material by the developers and or their agents, these homes are not destined for islanders. They cannot afford them. Unemployment will be increasing on the island due to the consequences of the coronavirus. Businesses will close. Incomes will be reduced. Expectations will evaporate. State benefits will be reduced as part of the government strategy to recoup the money advanced during the outbreak. The existing dwellings in the area would be compromised, destroying the quality of life of residents and making them part of a large housing estate with noise and disruption. The site is within the Solent Special Protection Area, which confers some protection for the value of habitat, especially for overwintering coastal birds needing to feed and rest undisturbed. Mitigation measures conflict with the objectives of the scheme and should not be employed. The so-called government injection of £2.45 million is not a planning consideration and must be ignored. That money would be better spent elsewhere. The care system is a shining example. Traffic fumes and contamination will increase, which the council wish to keep the minimum or eliminate as part of their health strategy. Should permission be granted, this would create a dangerous and undesirable precedent for the future to the detriment of the island. The application has no merit and should be refused. Ends. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure Russell will, be, will have the opportunity to uh, refute some of those allegations. Um, we have the second uh, uh, statement to be read from Mr Guy Eads. Thank you, Chair. So this is the statement on behalf of Mr Guy Eads. Branston Farm Study Centre. Permission to change to 42 affordable rural homes and rural business units. Whilst the change to rural business units is sound and beneficial and rural affordable homes are required on the island, it is difficult to understand why this is a suitable location for 42 new affordable rural homes. There are poor communications except by car, no nearby other residents, nor primary school shops or amenities. If located in or adjacent to a village, this would make sense, but this location is isolated and undeveloped and at a location not previously identified for housing. If the land had not belonged to the Isle of Wight Council, it is hard to conceive the Isle of Wight Planning Committee giving approval to any other owner or developer. And that's the end of the statement, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move on to the uh, agent, uh, Mr. Phil Salmon. I believe Martin Pearl is here as well speaking. Is that correct? Uh, 
according to my list it is. Uh, are you there, Martin? Yes, I'm here. Claire. Thanks. Two and a half minutes each. OK, Martin, okay. you start. I'll start. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to contribute, uh, Claire. Um, I just wanted really to provide some context to, to Russell's um, presentation um, and also I think maybe respond to uh, those statements. Um, Vectis had a, an involvement on this site for the last two or three years. Our communities team were part of the Down to the Coast project and worked closely with the AOMB unit, um, Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. When this was marketed, this site, we felt that it was really important to put in an application that was going to do justice to uh, the ecology, the, the biosphere designation of the island, and also to provide much needed homes here. Um, so from the outset, this has been very much a partnership approach to uh, developing the site. Um, and that partnership has also included, obviously, the council as well, who have been very supportive of this. Um, our um, the our, our approach from the very outset has been to recognise that obviously we are building on a um, green space and so we wanted to not only provide a quality environment but enhance the remaining green space so hence Vectis will take on the biodiversity park, um, the community orchards um, and the green strip that Russell referred to where we will um, encourage local residents to be involved in, in a whole range of um, act, horticultural activities. Um, we are obviously, we recognise that uh, affordable homes are absolutely critical on the island at the moment. Vectis are key providers for the island and we will look to bring in a significant amount of Homes England grant to be able to fund these. They will be affordable, they will be for local people, and we will look not only to provide homes, but also to develop um, a community as a, as a long standing and sustainable entity. So um, my hope is that the, the committee will recognise the benefits for the island and support this, uh, at which point we will go back to Homes England tomorrow and hopefully get the grant approved by them next week and start on site in February. Thank you, Claire. That's for me. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Phil, you have two and a half minutes. OK, thank you, Chairman. Uh, the application as presented reflects three years of evaluation of opportunities and the outcomes of technical assessments in order to provide a scheme that delivers on a number of key objectives of the current planning policy framework. It also reflects the outcomes of ongoing discussions with the Parish Council and the community, as outlined in the submitted statement of community involvement, reflecting the comprehensive public exhibition held in Newchurch in March of this year. The proposals meet both economic job creating need as well as objectives for delivering the type of houses to match community requirements. This is a rural site, yes, but it is successful in exhibiting significant sustainability credentials. These include the provision of affordable local need housing in an accessible location where connectivity to public transport and footpaths is enhanced. It includes the creation of a new rural business centre on a brownfield site to generate significant numbers of rural based jobs. It provides for the significant enhancement of biodiversity on site with a comprehensive landscape scheme and a detailed management regime that would serve to ensure that appropriate management of habitats and newly created areas are important for biodiversity. The proposed buildings are well designed and are reflective of the rural location of the application site. The replacement buildings for business space are proposed to use natural materials and are reflective of farm style designs, which are in many regards an improvement on the existing buildings. The highway proposals reflect positive discussions with the island roads and the planners and have been revised to ensure high standards of safety and low risk in accommodating the increase in traffic. Significant weight must be placed on the fact that there is a housing provider associated with the application that will ensure a timely delivery of the residential scheme. The government currently places significant weight on deliverability, particularly in areas that are failing to deliver sufficient housing numbers to meet actual local need. The application proposals comply with the national planning objectives set out in the MPPF. They also comply fully with the policies set out in the Island Plan core strategy, given the improvement to sustainability criteria, the provision of new homes, the links to public transport 
and the improvement of biodiversity and the creation of jobs. The merits of the scheme reflect those in high, held in high regard by appeal inspectors who have supported schemes that are shown to be deliverable and meet objectives for economic regeneration and delivering housing need. As such, there is a strong planning policy case in favour of approving this application. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, we now move on to the local member, Councillor Claire Mosdell. You have five minutes, Claire. Thank you. When I was a child and I grew up on Forest Road in Winford and attended New Church Primary School, I have fond memories of school trips to Branston Farm. But my more vivid and lasting memories of the place that I called home, it meant cups of sweet tea and biscuits when I got home from school, it meant basil brush on the TV and we're somewhere safe and warm. The memories and experiences we have as a child help shape us as adults. When I read comments with regards to affordable housing, it makes me wonder if the people remember how important those early stages of life are in forming you. The reality of the housing market today for me is the lived experience of my best friend, who I went to New Church Primary School with um, and has had the massive worry recently of her daughter and her daughter's husband and two children being given notice on their property they rented during COVID and having to find somewhere else to live. For every property that goes on the rental market, there will be over 80 applicants. Can you imagine the worry of finding a property, being able to afford it and the fees and the deposits are involved? This young family's children attend New Church Primary School. They are registered with a GP and yes, they do drive a car and have ended up living in a property that is costing them over £900 a month. She is a student nurse and he works in a supermarket. The, pe the property has two bedrooms and at best you can call the third room a box room and most of their income will go on keeping a roof over their family's heads and there were many times over that search for that property they are now in that had them in the fear of being homeless. As of today the number of families registered on Ireland Home Finder is 958 and the number of children under 18 and not the applicant or the joint applicant in these families is 1904. As of Monday the numbers of families in temporary accommodation, including emergency accommodation, is 126 and the number of children is 269. Please do not make me listen to discussions on whether there is a need in rural communities for affordable housing, as you would only have to spend a few minutes at the school gates talking to parents on how much they pay in rent, how much they would love to own their own home, but most of their income is taken up by paying such large rents. Do not make me listen to if our health system can take any more when this housing is for those that already are here on the island, already registered with a GP, already driving a car, because I am sorry, it is ridiculous to think that everyone on low income takes a bus. How many on this committee have actually caught a bus on a regular basis and have any idea how much it costs for two adults and two children to take, for an example, a bus from Lake to Newport? We have a chance here to help Vectors Housing provide good quality, affordable accommodation for Ireland families. We all have the right to have a home and our future is in the children that will grow up in the lovely area and bring life back into Branston. As a ward councillor, I have a part for this project. One is for a safe exit to be insured onto the main road with an extension of 30 miles an hour speed limit and the traffic management layout to ensure cars do not fall out onto what is oncoming speeding traffic. Two is for a safe right of way route from Watery Lane past the Branston site to Atsea, as this would then join the already right of way that can be walked safely all the way to Lake. And an assurance that the light industrial buildings will complete the need for these buildings in this area and therefore would be taken into account if any future application comes in for light industrial at Sandown Airport. When you consider this application in the comfort of your own homes, sat behind those computer screens, imagine being the parents who are living in temp temporary accommodation offers, overwhelmed by uncertainty, whilst trying to create a sense of security for their children, helping them focus on things such as their education. Many of us in our community are not sat with the anxiety of worrying whether we'll be able to feed our families and our children after paying extortionate rents. Many people will not be able to afford to save a deposit to buy a property. They are just trying to survive, living day to day, trying to provide a home for their loved ones. 
please do not let me hear that young families do not have the right to live in rural locations because we should be able to provide choice and it will be your chance this evening to help give 42 island families a place they can call home. Thank you. Chairman, I think you're, you're on mute there. My apologies there. Uh, I'll now allow Russell to uh, reply to the comments made, then we'll open it to debate. Thank you, Chairman. Um, There's not too much for me to say, I don't think. Um, most of those most of the comments you know relate to what people feel about the proposals but there's a couple of things that i just do want to to mention um firstly uh, in one of the comments um there was reference to an eia assessment um that's where officers consider whether a development will have a significant impact on the environment and therefore uh, necessitate uh, an environmental statement officers have carried out that screening opinion during the processing of the application um, and have concluded that um, there won't be significant impacts on their environment uh, and that an environmental statement is not necessary. And I think that that conclusion is reflected in the comments that we received from our ecologist and, and natural England. Um, in terms of affordable housing, um, it, it's a well known concept. It, it's set out in national policy. It's a material consideration. Um, there are also comments that the business park and employment is not a material consideration. It clearly is. Um, the MPPF gives a lot of weight to employment, um, so I can hear feedback. Um, but um, in addition to that, um, policy DM8 um, and policy SP3 carry a lot of weight in the island plan. Island uh, core strategy in terms of employment, so it clearly is a material consideration. Um, in terms of the brewery, um, there was a comment that that should be considered as part of this scheme. Well, the brewery has permission, but of course, um, the officer report considers the combined impact of this development and the brewery together. And uh, of course, members can consider that as well during the debate and in your deliberations for this, this proposal. Um, there's also a comment that the site is within the special protection area. Um, it's not in the special protection area, um, which relates um, uh, to coastal waters. Um, it's a long way away from that designation, but it also is not within the um, the buffer area that Natural England have provided, which is any development within 5.2 kilometres of that SBA designation. So the site is not even within the buffer area. Hence, the legal agreement isn't seeking to capture any funds towards the bird uh, aware solent strategy um, for recreational impacts. Um, in terms of uh, how the application is considered, I think one of the comment alludes to um, how you know these things should all be separated out in terms of the allotment and, and the housing and the business park. But officers consider that all of those um, proposals should be considered in the round together um, because uh, those ingredients to the development, if you like, um, all feed into how this um, proposals seem to be acceptable from officers. So there's that combined approach of on-site living, really lovely areas of open space, an area for an, a you know, potential allotment, but also the opportunity to work in nearby units, but to provide that rural employment as well. So it is a whole proposal and it all should be considered together. It shouldn't be all separated out is what I'm trying to say. Um, and I think that is it for now. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Russell. Um, I'll now open it to uh, debates and questions. Uh, Paul Fuller has indicated earlier that he uh, wants some clarification in a couple of questions. So uh, let's start with Councillor Fuller. Thank you. I think Claire probably picked up on this. Sorry, Councillor Mosdell picked up on this. Um, um, and I've looked through the the um, uh, conditions and I didn't see anything. But is there going to be a local lettings policy in place? That's question one. The second one is about the um, enhanced path which will connect it with um, Watery Lane. Is that enhanced path going to be accessible for cyclists and horse riders? I can I can actually build upon that later on. Um, with the maps that were shown earlier on, we've had representations from the Isle of Wight Ramblers. Um, I wanted to ask a question about um, footpath NC24, and will that be upgraded at all to allow residents from Winford to be able to 
access this area, which will provide gainful employment and gainful employment also down to the um, nurseries. And the final question I've got is that there is a housing need also for one bedroom units. And I don't believe there's any one bedroom units on this. And can that be clarified, please? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll answer the one on one bedroom units because one bedroom units are usually wanted by single people and the majority of them want, want to live in urban areas rather than rural. So there, I think there's a logic there, but I'll pass the other questions across to Russell. For um, thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Fuller. Um, in terms of local letting policy, yes, we um, the proposal um, we, which is set out in the report is for the, the, the typical three stage local lettings policy that will apply for the houses um, when they go on the market when they're first built, but also when they go on the market in the future. Um, so effectively in, in the first period, um, the properties would be uh, sent out to market for people who live in the parish of Newchurch. Um, if after that period, um, whatever that period is, officers will negotiate it. It's, it's typically between two or three months. Um, after that period, then the net, if you like, is expanded um, to include people who live in New Church as well, but also shoulder parishes, parishes, adjoining parishes to the area. I would have thought that two stage approach would take up all of the need to be on, to be quite honest with you. Um, but if after that, that period, there are still properties um, remaining for either rent or intermediate housing, um, then the net is again expanded to the whole island um, and and it, it will be left as that. Um, so that's the local lettings policy um, and that reflects um, the normal approach we have in our, on other rural sites or well any affordable housing site. Um, in terms of the path to Watery Lane, um, as I understand it, that, that will be for um, walkers and cyclists um, because obviously that that is the need for this site. You know that the whole purpose of that path is for people to be able to get to the bus stops in Watery Lane, but also Watery Lane um, is part of the national cycling route, and it and it connects to various other cycling routes. And I'll show you. I can show you that on a map in a minute if you like. Um, in terms of what the uh, the Ramblers have said, um, footpath NC24 will it be upgraded? Will the um, the contribution that's been agreed for £15,000 has been agreed with the rights of way manager and it is specifically to upgrade those rights of way that go through the site and link on to other areas so that that he, he will spend that money wisely no doubt to upgrade the footpaths um, for, for the you know the areas that are most used if you want to put it that way. Um, I think that's everything. Thank you Councillor Fur. Councillor Fuller, you've got a supplementary. Sorry, you're on mute, Councillor Fuller. You're still on mute. There, I'm, I'm, I think I'm there. The reason I asked about the um, horse riders is that there is a gap for horse riders um, getting through to Mackett's Lane, which is on the other side of, um, um, uh, I can't remember what fight, fighting, the Fighting Cox Cross. And there, there is the opportunity there to actually connect um, the bridleways with the, with the south of the island, which is something that I know is slightly restricted. I'm sure Claire will probably come back on me and, and say that I'm wrong, but I'm just, I'm just wondering whether there is an opportunity there that we could take advantage of. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Fuller. Chairman, if you're happy, I can, I can answer that. I've, I've put you up a slide showing um, the, the, the various transport routes around this site, actually. Um, you know all of the, the the sustainable transport routes and 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 the roads. Um, the bridleways are shown in purple, um, and as Councillor Fuller has quite rightly pointed out, there there are you know there is nothing that connects those bridle routes. If you're on a horse, you'd have to go on the road, um, which um, I've got to say I never enjoyed when I was horse riding. But um, you know the, the the emphasis of this site is very much about um, affordable housing, family housing, and that business use, and so we have to 
consider whether it is relevant to this site to require it to then upgrade um, the bridleways, um, noting the fact that being affordable housing means that um, you know these sites are always you know marginal and viability. So I think that um, you know we, we negotiated hard to get the fifteen thousand um, pounds, and obviously you know that that in, involved some consideration of how that would affect site viability. So it's, it's whether whether it is actually realistic in terms of the deliverability of the site to actually require those bridleways um, to be to be improved because there are quite large gaps between the bridleway network in this area. Um, you know, if it was just a small section that related to this site, then it, you know, I think it might be relevant, but um, it, I think it's going to be a struggle for this site to do that. I have Councillor Howe next. John. Well, thank you, Chairman. Um, may I first say that so a lot of chatting about this as somebody who was born and bred on the island is that Councillor Mosdow has said everything I agree with and I think it's a wonderful idea. But I have one question for Russell if it's all right. Is okay. that there is a matter there is um, allotments and business stuff and other things on site as well as housing. Can he tell me that if anybody wants to change anything to other ideas that it has to come back to planning before they're allowed to do so? Thank you. Uh, Russell, do you have a response? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I, I, I suppose, um, Councillor Howe, um, anything proposed as outside of the approved plans um, would need permission because there's that uh, condition two which which um, secures the development proposals to be exactly what's shown on those plans so anything additional above that um, would require planning consent so you know I, I, um, if I take a stab in the dark you know if, if people wanted to put various sheds on the allotments those sorts of things that would go, go outside of what the approved plan shown therefore consent would be required um, and I think that's right to, to protect how that site looks, how it functions. Chairman, can I just say that I think that the what's come up with, is, although I did like Branston Farm as an idea, what the council, um, what the officers have come up with in conjunction with the developers has, has come up very well and I think they've made a very good job of it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I have Councillor Cameron next. George. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, uh, my question was the same as, as Councillor Fuller's. It's about the lo local homes or lettings policy. We must ins insist on that uh, to implement that. It's very important. These uh, small areas, they, they spend a lot of time and money developing their local needs, housing needs, and uh, we must take that into consideration. So I'm, I'm pleased that it has been considered as well. But uh, uh, Russell kindly answered my question there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cameron. Uh, Councillor Hollis, Richard. Right, thank you, Chairman. Um, looking at this, uh, I have actually, if one, if one just stops and ignores that this is a council application and thinks about the island plan and whether one would does it meet the criteria of the island plan because i think there are certain areas that this does not meet the criteria of the, of the island plan or is very close on on the fringes and uh, on page 29 of the island plan one of the key points of SP1 is that in all cases of development on non previously developed land, and we take the housing side as a non previously developed land, but we need to clearly demonstrate how it enhanced the character and context of the local area. Um, you've got a, I think you've got a slight sort of, uh, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a difficulty or there's an interpretation there. Then if we move through, on page 32 of the island plan, 
uh, there is the question why, as opposed to in the um, SP1, and uh, 5.18, it says, on the Isle of Wight, it's particularly important to preserve the predominantly rural character of the county and the majority of its settlements. So preserving the rural character, character I'm not sure that building any form of housing estate on farmland is preserving the rural character. Then we move to 5.29 of the island plan, and it says, in all cases of development on non-previously developed land, we'll need to clearly demonstrate how it will enhance the character, the context of the local area. Again, that's the same sort of theme. And then on 5.38 of the local plan, this is on SP2 housing, um, in relation to rural service centres, it, it comes down and says, it, it will be acceptable, it's not significantly adversely changed the size, scale, design of the character of the settlement. So you have that in the, in the, in the background. Um, however, because uh, I, I, don't, I don't wish one, this to be seen as setting a, a precedent that we could, we now it's uh, a sort of almost like a free for all for building on agricultural land. And I note that this agricultural land in the whole is actually very good quality. However, I think that in this, these, the, the situation that we have here is such a unique opportunity that in this case, we can, we can make our obviously allowances for that, but the, the strength behind this is so great for the opportunity to build affordable homes that it could be treated as a one-off uh, in this situation. So uh, I, when the time comes, I'd like to propose that this is, uh, we accept this, um, uh, the recommendation that this be approved. I have no other people asking to speak, so why don't you move that resolution? Well, I move that resolution as in, as in, the, in the papers, uh, um, the recommendation that it, it, with the conditions that this be approved. I'll second that, please, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor jones Evans. Uh, so we have it um, uh, posed and seconded. Uh, we'll now go to the vote. Uh, the clerk will read out the names and uh, please respond for, against or abstain. It's just the three words, for, against or abstain. Councillor Beston. For. Councillor Brody. He's left. He's gone home. Councillor Cameron. For. Councillor Fuller. For. Councillor Hastings. For. Councillor Hollis. For. Councillor Howe. For. Jones Evans. For. Councillor Kilpatrick. For. Councillor Tyndall. For. Councillor Price. For. Councillor Quirk. For. And I'm assuming Councillor Brodie hasn't come back in, so. So the motion is carried. 11 for, none against, and none abstained. Thank you very much. Uh, if you move on to uh, item two on the agenda, uh, reference 20 oblique FUL, uh, 31 and land to the rear of 21 to 31, Ventnor Road, Apsey, Sandown. Uh, would the officer like to present please? <coughs> Chairman, I believe the officers mute. 
I can't hear anything either. So is are you on Hello. mute? Try again. I still can't hear anything. Hello, Chairman. Can hear you now. Oh, sorry, I was having trouble with the microphone. Do apologise. Um, can you see the presentation on the screen, Chairman? Uh, yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Go, go ahead. Thank you very much. OK, members, um, this application uh, relates to a property 31 Ventnor Road uh, and a paddock to the rear. Um, you'll note at the top of my screen um, that uh, the Raj Premier store Apps Heath and the uh, Apps Heath Crossroads with Newport Road and Ventnor Road is, is where my cursor is. Um, and the application site and entrance is about 160 metres to the south um, here. You'll note as well that uh, the application site um, consists of an existing residential property, number 31 Ventnor Road, um, its driveway and rear garden, and an existing paddock area to the rear. Um, to the north um, west uh, is existing housing, um, and to the south and east is agricultural land, um, and these are extended uh, gardens um, here and here. Uh, again, this is just a plan identifying the extent of the site area a bit more clearly. Um, you can see number 31 here. Um, numbers 29 and Eastern are the uh, most uh, adjacent properties. Um, there is an existing paddock here that I'll just draw, um, an existing stable here I'll just draw members' attention to because you can use that as a reference when we go through some of the photographs that, that I'll come on to. Um, members will also note um, that there is an existing public footpath that runs through here. And it also turns north. Uh, this is NC28 that runs to the south, and this is NC29 that runs to the north. If I just revert back quickly to the aerial photography, um, you'll note much further to the south, this is the public bridleway um, that runs through here, which is NC41, and that runs through to Shanklin. Some photographs for members of the uh, the application uh, street scene. Um, so this is the existing access. This is number 31 um, and this is number 29 here. Um, you'll see the rooftop here of Easton um, and it, you'll see it much more clearly here. Again, just for members, um, again, here's the site area uh, and just where I've taken the photographs from. Um, you'll say at the moment there's an existing access. Um, and at the moment, the frontage is defined by uh, generally low walling um, and hedgerows. Um, and between number 29 and thir number 31, there's an existing hedgerow that runs alongside the uh, north side of the access point. Just taking some look at the photos of the internals of the site, um, you'll see the conservatory here from number at the rear of number 31. This is the boundary with Easton at the back and its rear garden. Um, this boundary here um, is the boundary, hedged boundary to the rear of number 29. Um, so that is looking through this boundary here. Um, and this outbuilding is approximately here. So again, you know, that's just looking back really through the access way. This photo here is taken. You'll see the stable lock I referred to previously, which is located here. And this is me stood about here looking across the site. Um, again, you can see the undulating nature of the site. Uh, there's a bit of a bank that runs through here uh, and along this side here. This is me stood in this corner and I'm taking a shot back through, looking back towards the Newport, uh, the Ventnor Road properties. Um, this boundary here is behind the stable block here. This boundary is this boundary through here. Um, and again, you can see number 31 over here. Again, taking a look over in this corner here, that's showing the stable block and the boundaries to the rear of numbers, uh, the Bent Road properties a bit more clearly. Again, properties to the uh, rear garden areas through here to the uh, properties to um, Newport Road. These are some external photos. So these are showing the wider context. Um, so this photograph here is taken from NC28, and that is at this point here. Um, where the footpath runs through and then comes out into agricultural land. 
although the sort of tread path actually goes like this through the tree boundary, um, there is actually the, the actual defined footpath actually continues over out into the field. Um, you'll see that I've taken some other photographs for you from this point here, which is looking from the agricultural field um, toward the mature treed boundary of the paddock um, to the south. This one up here is taken from the northeast, and that is looking across the agricultural land towards the um, uh, treed, tree line through here, which defines the edge of Newport Rome uh, Properties Garden. So our actual site boundary is further to the west. Uh, so these are this this one I've taken for you along Ventnor Road, and this shows uh, that the um, that through this gap here is looking towards the Ventnor Road properties, and you'll see that the actual paddock over here is much further in this direction and well screened by trees. Looking at the proposed development, um, the application proposes a bowmouth junction off of Ventnor Road um, in a similar position to the existing access with a vehicle overrun here. Um, and that would lead through the existing driveway and garden area into the paddock where it would uh, provide access to an arrangement of seven dwellings, access in a, in a cul-de-sac fashion. Um, there would be a, a, a retained area of open space to the south side of that um, where the existing mature tree line would be maintained. And this hatching here shows the existing scrub that would be retained and enhanced as part of the overall landscaping of the site. Um, as part of the development, there is a need to remove the existing garage shown by this green hatching here um, at the front of number 31 to facilitate access. And the plan is to relocate a single garage to the rear of this and a new driveway access off the road. Um, you may have noted from some of the highways comments that there is a, a need to realign this uh, proposed hedge line here slightly to improve visibility for that access and that's secured by planning condition. Um, the actual road itself is 5.1 metres wide here. It then narrows at 3.8 through here um, and then widens again as we come past the garden and into the into the paddock. Um, and then there is some localised narrowing as it comes down towards the turning area for service vehicles. And there members will note that there are some passing bays here and here and here, um, as well as the width here to enable vehicle passing through the site. These Bungalows, these properties through here, uh, plots one through to three, are single storey bungalows. These are two storey houses, um, with these being uh, all three, uh, with these being two beds, these are three beds, and again, we've got a mix of three beds and two beds through here as well. So the proposal is to maintain all the tree lines, so none of the trees would be removed as part of the development. Oh. And the I'll just come on to the landscaping plan, which shows in a bit more detail that the proposals through here is to maintain and enhance existing hedgerow. There's quite a significant uh, improvement in terms of the hedgerow habitat as part of the landscaping proposed. Um, because of the topography of the site, um, there will be a need for retaining walls through here uh, as these are stepped, and I'll show you in a bit with the site sections. Um, but there are um, new privet hedging that will be planted between plots. Um, and then again, um, there would be some new tree planting spread throughout the development. Members will note this area here, which is retained for um, an attenuation tank for the surface water drainage. And surface water drainage would effectively by, be directed to the water course that runs along this boundary, or just outside this boundary, with foul sewage being directed, as indicated by these red lines, to the foul sewer um, that goes back up into Bentner Road. Again, just taking a look at the access arrangements, as I know that's quite an important uh, aspect to this proposal. Um, this is taking a look at the entrance into number 31, um, and you will see a concrete, uh, a tarmac, uh, an edged curb running north uh, towards the Apse Heath Junction, uh, which currently provides a bit of pedestrian uh, refuge along this edge of the road up to um, the junction. Um, you'll note um, there's on street parking along this side of the road, um, and that we are in a 30 mile per hour uh, limit at this point. Um, this shows the relationship between number 29 and the proposed access um, route, which would come through close to this boundary, an existing hedgerow boundary through between um, that access and number 29. Um, and again, this is the relationship here with number 31 um, to the access point. And you'll note the garage here that would be removed to facilitate that. And again, these are just showing the other direction with the verge running down to the public right away, which is located here and runs in this direction. And again, the image where the access road run through here 
down into the uh, paddock and, a, and the current boundary with the property eastern to the south. Some photos again, just showing pedestrian connectivity currently in the in the local area. Um, this is the Apsheath Junction, you know, the Premier Store. Um, this is the uh, the curve and um, the curbed uh, tarmac area, which runs down toward the site, and it consistently runs down there. But as you'll appreciate from these photos, there is a narrowing at various points. Um, this again is showing the Apsheath Junction, and it shows that continuing past and up and round to the existing bus stop. Um, there are obviously another bus stop on the other side of the road, but there is no crossing point at this point. Um, the crossing points are located over by the shop here. This is just showing the uh, plans for the alterations to the existing house. Um, and this is the garage here that would be removed as indicated. And there would just be a couple of windows reinstated through here. Um, this is removing a later addition um, that was previously added to the property. And members raised and officers raised no concern with those changes. Just uh, for members, um, uh, just to uh, show you the indicated elevations. Um, obviously, this is plot one. So again, it's just a single story bungalow, very simple and balanced, um, and a mix of uh, brickwork and cladding to the walls and a natural slate roof. Again, this is plots two and three that follow on from that on the north side of the access road. And again, they're, they're simple bungalows with uh, horizontal cladding and brick plinths, and again, natural slate roofs. And this is the corner plots four and seven. Again, uh, two story in scale, um, balanced elevations with uh, stonework and brickwork facings and natural slate roof. And this is the middle two units at the lower point of the site um, at the towards the eastern end, which provide two bed housing. And again, is stone faced, natural slate roof uh, and a mix of timber, uh, timber and um, uh, timber sort of cladding and concrete seals are proposed. Again, just a simple image of the garages, but again, that reflects the uh, material treatments of the uh, housing. Um, in terms of the um, uh, the applicant has done a comparison drawing just to show this in the wider context. So you can see the layout proposed for the housing. So you've got the bungalows through here. Um, these are the two story houses through here. And there's a comparison made with the brambles over here, which is bungalows. Again, you can see an access road coming between properties through to the Brambles, although this is a much flatter site than the, the paddock area. And again, I've indicated on here for members uh, the distances between boundaries and also the neighbouring properties, um, 57 metres to the property at Benton Road. And there's about 86 metres to uh, Heathfield House um, off Newport Road. In terms of some sections, just to give uh, members an idea of how the development would sit within the site. So the paddock area is here. Um, you'll note that there's a, a bank that this is the plateau where the, the stable block currently sits. Um, and then at the moment, the site banks down and falls down towards the eastern boundary. Um, and there's quite a bit of a dip in the centre of the site, um, which you'll note from here is you've got this fall um, into the site in both directions um, from both the north and the south. So that effectively, these properties at the end sit um, at, at the lowest point. Um, and again, Members will note from uh, looking at these sections that there will be a need to reprofile the land within the paddock to obviously create a more smoother and gentle slope to the proposed access road. And members will also note the sort of uh, plateauing and terracing of the plots as they um, fall down with the topography of the site. Again, this is a section done by the applicant which shows the relationship with Heather House that I've just uh, sort of referred to um, in terms of, and this gives the impression of the elevation uh, differences between the, the site um, and the properties in Newport Road. And these properties are very long gardens, which um, obviously slope down um, to meet the application levels. These are some CGI's that are just um, produced to help members um, have an idea of, of what the development might look like. These are the two story houses at the back of the site um, showing the landscape context. All the houses would have off road parking, two spaces each. Um, and this is the turning area and private driveway shown at the back. And this is again coming from the paddock area. Uh, coming from where the stable blocks are currently situated down into the site and again showing the bungalows on the northern side. Um, again, you'll note the hedgerows and the terracing of properties and the access road that would generally fall down towards the eastern end and the turning head. 
that's the end of my present cha uh, presentation, Chairman. Uh, recommendation is conditional approval. Um, there would be uh, contributions secured by um, legal agreement uh, towards improvement of uh, NC28 um, direct to the south of the site and also affordable housing in line with the Council's SPD. Thank you. Councillor Quirk, you're on mute. Sorry for that. Thank you for reminding me. Um, we have, we move on to uh, objectors and supporters. Uh, we have two objectors, Mrs. L. Dowden and Dr. Tony Hurst. Uh, are they here? Yes, Mrs. Dowden here. Yep, Tony Hurst here. Can okay, you hear so, me okay? So we've got can you. you hear yes, we can Sorry. hear you. You can. We can hear you. So uh, you have two and a half minutes each. Uh, so um, first, Mrs. Dowden. Right, Please I can start ahead. now, yes? Whenever you're okay, ready. Thank you. 36 objectors being residents, the corner shop, Island Roads, our MP, Parish Council and CPRE are strongly opposed to this estate for seven open market houses on a green field. With eight infill houses built in the last year, there's no identifiable need for more market housing. It's not an exception site. Apps Heath is a hamlet in the wider rural area, outside, not near any defined settlement boundary, outside the bay and has never been selected as a sustainable rural settlement. Unachievable housing targets quoted from a draft to be revised plan hold no weight and are being challenged with approval from the council leader. Applying para 11D of the MPPF, no benefits would outweigh the significant adverse impacts and harm to the area's rural character, visual amenity, light, noise and air pollution to residents. With no meaningful screening, as many properties are elevated from the site, their gardens and the paddock are respite from the busy road. There's no vehicular access to the paddock. The proposed road is squeezed in, dangerous, too narrow for vehicles to pass safely, with no continuous or safe footpath to the main Newport Road. There are no cycle tracks, a bridleway only accessed by cycling a fast and dangerous stretch of road. It would be a backland site, not infilling, unsustainable and car reliant. Apart from one shop and bus stops, there are no facilities. Public footpaths NC28 and 29 are unviable, even with 28 improved. There's only a curb to walk along parts of Venton Road, and most of the footpath is below the absolute minimum requirement. No space for people to pass. This is dangerous and can't be improved. There's no safe pedestrian route. Visibility displays are flawed. Island roads refer no less than 10 times to pedestrian dangers. A planning officer's view on safety should not override highways authority. The proposal is contrary to MPPF para 11D as the adverse impacts would significantly and demonstrably outweigh any very minimal benefits. This is a green field never built on. Comparing the brambles is wrong, which was a brownfield brickwork site. This scheme offers no social, economic or environmental benefits. There's no affordable housing, so it's not exceptions housing. The shop has objected. Schools are full. You can't safely walk to the shop or bus stops and the character of the landscape would be significantly harmed. No mitigation measures can negate these serious impacts. Even the planning officer gives reasons for refusal. This scheme would set a precedent. For justified planning reasons, it must be refused. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Arden. Uh, Dr. Tony Hurst, you have two and a half minutes. OK, thank you. The aerial view of the development area shows the remaining piece of Apps Heath Apps Heath's original heathland. This application seeks to remove that greenfield space. The advising report claims the development outside of any defined settlement boundary may support local services a car drive away. The last public building in Apps Heath is now housing. This is not sustainable. The CGI shows a single car in front of each house and a front lawn. I suggest these will soon be converted to parking. Revised documents were uploaded yesterday after tabling of the advisory report. Has the, has the committee had time to review them, I wonder? Have other objectors had chance to comment? One such document includes visibility lines drawn from the access road to the centre line of the main carriageway, counter to much accepted practice. The 43 metre line is for traffic calms, 30 mile an hour local access roads. Personal experience suggests vehicles travelling at far greater speeds. 
do parked cars count as the calming measures that force vehicles onto the centre line? Commonly accepted sight lines up the road require control of the corner of 29 outside the application. Looking down, conditions limit obstructions at the corner of 31 to 1 metre, adding to already suggested freedom limiting robust shared boundary conditions and contrasting with a 60 centimetre road site height limit previously imposed on 18A opposite. Park delivery vans at 2 metres high would add to impaired visibility. Island roads recommended refusable on grounds of non-sustainability, citing hazards to pedestrian access due to a lack of a suitable footway. An unlit footpath over muddy fields does not provide a viable, safe or accessible alternative. Island roads also objected with explicit safety concerns due to potential increased risk of conflict between motorists and pedestrians. Your report is contrary to their opinion, suggesting acceptable risk because people already use the road. Many residents have concerns about the current risk and would disagree. Approving the proposal replaces the current dwelling and paddock with a non-sustainable development requiring cars to access services elsewhere. It destroys original heathland, changes the island's aerial view and reduces greenfield space rather than encouraging brownfield development. It adds to highway safety risk affecting pedestrians and motorists. It should be refused. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, we now have Mr. Andrew White, uh, the planning agent. Are you there, Andrew? I am chairman. Good evening. Good evening. You have five minutes. Thank you, chairman. The greenfield nature of the site outside of a defined assessment boundary has generated concerns. However, policy SP1, which previously could have provided grounds to refuse permission, is out of date on the basis that the council doesn't have a five year land supply, coupled with a persistent record of under delivery. As such, the presumption in favour of sustainable development applies, meaning permission should be granted unless any identified adverse impacts would, would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits of bringing forward this scheme. This very rationale has been applied by planning inspectors in at least four cases this year when allowing small housing schemes outside of defined settlements. Reaching this stage is the result of a methodical approach on the part of the landowner. Firstly, the Schlar process concluded in 2018 that the size is suitable and, and being deliverable with a potential yield of 12 dwellings. The site was then allocated for housing purposes through the draft island planning strategy. Throughout the ensuing two years, my client invested her life savings to create a comprehensive application, having commissioned a number of technical surveys that have informed the most sensitive approach to developing this site. The Council, despite providing two rounds of pre-application advice, as well as considering an earlier withdrawn application, has never ruled out the principle of a, of a developing this greenfield site. If anything, it has actually been encouraging of bringing forward the right scheme. Through the Schlar process, the island planning strategy and recent planning permissions for at least 10 new dwellings, the Council has clearly identified Apseath as having capacity to accommodate modest housing growth on the basis that it is close to and well connected with the Bay Key Regeneration Area. We understand there are concerns about building on greenfield land. However, there is no moratorium on such development. There is currently no policy for taking that approach. The island does not have a large supply of suitable and available brownfield land to meet housing need. And surely if the council was not prepared for this greenfield site to come forward, then that would have been highlighted long before now. This development would nestle into this visually contained site directly behind residential dwellings and would not awkwardly extend the built up pattern of Apseath into open countryside. Indeed, it would round off this corner of the settlement and also reflect the general arrangement of the brambles on the west side of Venston Road, being a cul-de-sac of 11 dwellings. As required by policy DM2, this proposal seeks to optimise the use of this land whilst paying due regard to constraints such as trees, views and topography. Moreover, the uh, proposed density is uh, substantially less than the brambles, which amounts to 22 dwellings per hectare, whereas our proposal is just under 10. As such, this proposal cannot be described as being overdevelopment. We have paid close attention to the proposed access arrangement, in increasing the separation distance between the road and adjoining houses through the use of landscape buffers to minimise the impact on those properties as a result of vehicle movements. Island roads have raised the issue of connectivity between the site and Newport Road. There is, however, an existing pavement used by current residents where you can walk directly out of the site to the corner shop and post office, thus helping to sustain that business. Whilst just around the corner on Newport Road, less than 200 metres away, is the bus stop. 
There is also a public footpath running to the south of the site, providing an alternative pedestrian link to Newport Road. The uh, developer would make a financial contribution of £5,000 towards upgrading this footpath. The property market has been buoyant of late and uh, developers are currently prepared to invest. I anticipate this site being built out quickly if approved, not only making a significant contribution to a sustainable housing growth, but it would also put around £1.5 million into the construction economy and local supply chain, whilst also providing a substantial financial contribution towards the delivery of affordable housing projects locally. We could reassure members that this is a high quality submission of a reduced density from nine to seven, attractive design with, the, with uh, traditional materials and with a mix of property types to uh, deliver much needed housing on the island where the build out rate is currently 61% of what it should be. All protected trees will be retained along with additional planting, resulting in a increase in bio biodiversity value of over 10%. As such, we have essentially given members good reason to support this scheme on the basis that the proposal includes all of the traits that provide for sustainable development without creating significant and demonstrable adverse impacts. This small build of homes with spacious gardens in the most unobtrusive, aesthetically pleasing style only serves to complement and enhance the uh, character of Apps Heath. It is therefore respectfully requested that permission is granted in line with your officer's recommendation. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we now have uh, the local member, Councillor Claire Mozzo. Are you there, Claire? Oh, I'm here. You have five minutes. Thank you. It's not often as a ward councillor you have the opportunity to speak on two applications with such significance within your ward on the same evening. Your decisions this evening will make a marked difference to what the future of housing can be mapped out on this island and other rural areas. This application will set a precedent for open market housing schemes in the wider rural area. This application for seven dwellings in a greenfield site fills me with fear that passing this application will open the floodgates for more of such applications of housing on dangerous roads and the ward councillors who have grown up in the area and have local knowledge into how dangerous a road is completely ignored once again. How many of you sat here with your ward councillors hats on have even had to fight so hard just to get applications heard by this, this committee and understand my absolute frustration of a bureaucratic system dictated to by legislation directives from those who have never or are likely never to set a foot on this island. You cannot walk up Fentner Road to Apps Heath Shop without taking your life in your hands. Cars speed down the road and there are accidents on a regular basis although we hear that it's only reportable accidents or fatality that can actually be taken into consideration. I would love to know when the planning officer took the photos of those of the road, as I've never seen it so quiet, and it really does give a completely unrealistic picture of the road. He must have been there ages to ensure that very few cars were actually in the photos presented. We are here tonight asking for consideration on an application to increase the issues that are already on this road, not by seven vehicles, not by 14, but clearly more. It is not as if this housing is going to be sold to island families, as they would be well out of the reach of many of those who are looking to find suitable accommodation. The Brambles has been referred to, but that was built on the old Brickwork site. It was a brownfield site, not greenfield. I have to read to you for a section of the application which can cause me considerable amusement that we expect to fill his com compensation to present a green to actually replace a green field and what is being offered reads as follows. The submitted soft landscaping and ecological enhancement scheme details that perimeter trees will be retained, site boundaries enhanced with the new native planting to create an ecological buffer and enhance connectivity around the site, and that front gardens as well as an open space south of the access would provide space for wildflower meadow and additional tree planting within the site. Sorry, but I'm only the only one that reads that and thinks what tripe. There is no way that this makes up for the development of a greenfield site. This application is out of character of the surrounding neighbouring properties and the area. It would have significant adverse impact and these impacts definitely outweigh any supposed benefits that have been expressed in the application. Recently, there was an application agreed on Newport Road for two bungalows just along from Apsi shop. These bungalows are on the market for £425,000. Seriously, 
Who can afford these properties unless they're moving from the mainland to the island? Just the deposit alone for these properties would be a minimum of £42,000. How long would you have to save to purchase one of these? We seem to be obsessed with saying that we cannot afford to build on, we can only afford to build on brownfield sites, and we can't afford to build on brownfield sites due to decontamination and de demolition costs. Well, I'm sorry, with house prices soaring for new homes, this is no longer an equation that I have faith in, because yes, material costs are increasing, and being a director of an electrical contracting company, I can say with evidence that the price of simple essentials such as cable are increasing, but they no way are increasing at the same pace that the current housing market prices are. If this application was before me for a house that was one house, carbon neutral, eco-friendly, of completely sustainable materials, then maybe I would give it consideration. But this is seven dwellings on a busy road on a greenfield site. Yes, as a Conservative, I believe in aspiration and the desire to work your way up the housing market, but we have to give people the chance to get on it first and not keep building houses for pure profit in rural areas and importing people from the mainland who are the few that can afford to purchase them. I remind you once again that your decisions will set a precedent for future applications because if you pass this application this evening, you will be setting a precedent. It will be set and it will be an example to pass other applications of this type by delegated decisions and will not even reach this committee to be considered. And it will be you guys as wall councillors who will be sat here fighting to save a greenfield site the same as I am this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mostow. Um, we'll now open it up to uh, discussion. Uh, I have John Howe and uh, Councillor John Howe and Councillor Paul Fuller. Uh, Councillor Howe. Well, thank you, Chairman. Once again, I have to agree with Councillor Mosdow on this one. But one thing amazes me is that um, these houses, I'm not sure what they're worth, but they look very expensive. And yet the only planning permission um, obligation to secure financial contribution is £5,000, which is less than £1,000 per house. But it seems very low. I'm not sure whether the officer would like to explain why it is so low, considering the price of these houses, although well, they look very expensive and they don't look as though they're going to meet um, low island residents. It looks like the sort of houses that is going to be um, looking for people coming from the mainland. And I agree with Claire, we've got to look after our local people and we've got to make sure they've got houses and they've got jobs. So when it comes around to it, Chairman, I will be objecting to this one, I'm afraid. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Stuart, would you like to respond to that? Sure, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear, I can me, hear now? you now? Yes. Yeah, sorry, it's a bit of a delay. Poor internet, I'll blame it on. Um, sorry. Um, yes, uh, Councillor Howe, um, there is a £5,000 uh, contribution towards rights of way. Um, that was agreed with the rights of way manager um, and negotiation with the applicant. Um, and that would go towards the provision of a, uh, a stabilised uh, section of the footpath and its first um, section to the south of the site. Um, and that was considered to be a proportionate uh, contribution similar to the level that we seek on other uh, similar sized developments across the island um, towards rights of way. Um, however, it's not the only contribution. There would also be a contribution towards affordable housing um, in line with the council's uh, agreed supplementary planning document. Um, and that equates to generally um, the open market sale value of those properties um, uh, taken, uh, take 100,000 times 3%. So um, just taking on a, a scheme near to me in Wootton, um, that at the moment, if they're going for about 
uh, 500,000 is equating to about 10,000 per property. So over a course of seven, you're looking at, at probably about 70,000 pound potentially um, coming from the development towards affordable housing. Now that's obviously um, just a, a guesstimate uh, on a similar uh, development. Um, but um, the point I'm making is that there would be another contribution towards affordable housing provision offsite in line with the council's agreed SPD. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Fuller, Paul. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my view really on this is that um, we should be developing either inside or immediately adjacent to settlement boundaries. Now, this to me is nowhere near a settlement boundary. Um, so what I would what I try to do as a member of the planning committee is I try to balance up um, any reasons why we shouldn't be supporting an application. You know, one of the questions that, that I wanted to ask, first of all, is there a justified need for three and four bedroomed houses? Um, to that, I have to answer no. Is there a community gain for these houses? Again, in response to that, the answer is no. Is the proposal supported by the wider community? Again, the answer is no. Will this, will this provide housing that is available to all? No. Does the, provide, does the proposal provide an adequate housing mix? No, it doesn't. It provides three and four bedroom houses, which we've got plenty of already on the island. For that reason, I would um, support the officer's recommendation, which is on page 61, whereby, um, just got to find this, where um, it's mentioned, uh, sorry, on page 68, where policy SP1 of the uh, community strategy explains the council will not support development where it is outside of and not immediately adjacent to the settlement boundary. And I look for a seconder. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I would ask you to sort of uh, hold that for a minute while others have their opportunities to speak. Um, uh, we'll come back to that motion. Um, Councillor Price, Matt. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm not going to say very much because um, I think um, colleagues have already actually said what I'd like to sort of um, point to, but I just want to go back over um, a, a couple of points. Um, you know, when we're looking at locations which are classed as sustainable, um, you know, this is a main road. There is no safe pedestrian route to any public transport or to the local amenities. Um, it's not within the settlement boundary. Um, and this development does more harm to the local area than it gives benefit. And for that, for those reasons alone, I will be not supporting this application. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Horace, Richard. Thank you, Chairman. Um, first of all, a question to um, to the yes. officers that um, uh, Mr. White made a statement that SP1 no longer applies. So is it out of date? Is that the whole of SP1 is out of date? Or is it out of date? Or is he correct in that assumption? Um, could I have, have clarification on that, please? Ollie, would you like to address that one? Sorry? I said, Ollie, would you like to address yes. that one? me typing um, asking that I may speak um, and indeed to speak on this uh, very issue. Uh, speak now. Thank you chair. Um, yes the the council cannot uh, currently demonstrate that it has a five-year land supply and in light of that uh, the agent is correct that the MPF policy is therefore in presumption of sustainable development and in such an instance, it is also the case that the policies relevant to housing are not considered to be up to date. Uh, there is, it has to be said members, there is a, 
a discussion around whether a locational policy um, rather than a numerical based or an allocation policy relates to housing, but I think this is still a key issue. Um, in arriving um, at the recommendation in the paper, your officers have concluded on balance that the proposal could be considered to be sustainable development in light of the tilted balance of the MPF in MPPF in such a situation. However, I, I do have to recognise um, that members of the committee may arrive at a different conclusion to officers over what constitutes sustainable development. I would, however, advise members that to uh, seek to refuse this application purely on the relation uh, grounds of S policy SP1, uh, that might be difficult to sustain on appeal. Thank you, Chairman. Right. Um, thank you. Right. The other thing, the other statement Mr White made was that there was no supply of brownfield land. Is that correct on the island? Only would you like to address that one as well? Uh, thank you. Uh, can you still hear me? Yes. Yes, excellent. Um, well, that depends on what you take to be your view of supply of brownfield land. Um, what we do know is that from the sites that have been made known to us through the local plan uh, preparation process, that there is not a significant level of brownfield or previously developed land, uh, what we would classify as being uh, available uh, to be developed at this moment in time. Uh, th that is a that can be a a consideration, but ultimately what we would have to be doing is looking at this application in front of us against the policies that we have in place. Um, yes, uh, the IPS or the Island Planning Strategy um, that we have uh, started work on uh, looked at uh, non brownfield sites and locations such as these but there is no weight to be given to those emerging policies at the moment. Uh, whilst we would very much, I think, like to prioritise brownfield land, um, whilst there is an encouragement uh, through the core strategy to do so, there is no absolute requirement. Thank you, Chair. Right, OK. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I, I still think that this, um, this application, I don't agree with my colleague, uh, Paul Fuller, I, I, I didn't know he was the, um, that we are here to uh, tell people what they're going to live in and what they're not going to live in. Um, however, uh, I think the access to this is severely lacking. And not only is it the access that uh, Island Roads are unhappy about, the, the, the pavements they're unhappy about, but I think about the neighbour. What The, the neighbour has a little uh, driveway next door to his house. Um, and then suddenly this is going to be a road with service vehicles, etc, etc. Uh, and I think that is unreasonable. I think it's unneighbourly. And um, uh, could that combined with the access, uh, Island Roads uh, uh, have, have queried the access, uh, I would have, very, I'd have difficulty in supporting uh, this application. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Jones-Evans, Julie. I can't hear you, Councillor Jones-Evans. Here I am. Sorry, I had to go and put the light on. Um, it was very getting very dark in here. I hadn't realised. Uh, yeah, I'm um, you know, sort of carefully thinking about this. Um, aesthetically, uh, I think it's a, it's a good development. And you know, when you see the overview, there is that sort of rounding off. I think it was described earlier of that of that how that area of housing, and I say it does mirror what happened acro across the road. Um, <sighs> I'm in I'm in a quandary because you know I'm not going to buy I'm not going to buy the line that the as some members are saying about well these who are these houses for you know going to be from the mainland and who wants four bedroom houses well because 
there are there are large families and people do there is such a thing called social mobility people do move out of smaller houses into bigger houses so we can't i think that's that's a sort of red herring can't really think of, think about that but what what i am um really mindful of as well is the fact this is going to be a, uh, a development that's going to happen you know it's, it's all of us probably have got sites in our in our wards that have just been just bought, I've got permission, but wait, waiting to, to develop. We've, I mean, Matthew and I have both got um, derelict sites, clear sites that have been sat there for years and years and years, causing eyesores and being, you know, as Council Hollis says, quite unneighbourly, really, in the in the, in the the way that that's that's happened. So I do I do see the uh, difficulty with the um, the access um, on on the road here. But then when we were here. Um, last time or the time before the issues that I brought up with down Smallbrook they they were sort of brushed aside really so that what that all went ahead so you know we we got these things that are put our way but um it's it's you have to balance it I guess between the individual application so I'm mean, very mindful also there's been a long period of pre-application discussion here also thank you very much um Ollie Mr Bolter for the ex expressing about about the the issue about our, our land supply and I think so I think on on balance I will support this application because I think we're in a very difficult situation um legally with, with not having our our land supply you know our new island plan hasn't come forward yet and basically I guess the, the island plan now is starting to show it show, show the cracks I won't want to put the the council in a situation where we have we have it um a cost cost against us so they so, say so be mindful that there has been a, a long pre-up pre-up discussion and reading the, the reading the, the officer's report and the, the final comments that you know 7.3 on page 82 uh that is concluded that in this case the economic social and environmental benefits of the proposed development would outweigh any harm that would be caused to those objectives as a result of it. So I, I'm going to support the application uh, along with um, officers' recommendations. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Jones Evans. Uh, I've got no one else asking to speak. So should I go back to go back to uh, Councillor Fuller and allow him to put his resolution and seek a second? The resolution has to thank, have thank you. Yeah, material thank you. planning issues that we're uh, if we're turning this down. Absolutely, and I think the objection that we've had from um, Island, Island Roads as well about the uh, um, the access to and from the site is another grounds for objecting to this application, um, as Councillor Hollis mentioned earlier on. Um, Co uh, Councillor Hollis did mention about um, we shouldn't be dictating what um, where people live. But one thing that I would say is when you look at our housing needs surveys that we had and we did have our housing needs assessment in 2018, there was a requirement for three and four bedroom, uh, sorry, one and two bedroom properties, not three and four bedroom properties, which this is. So I would say that there, there is a um, uh, th that that counters the the um, uh, position put. Um, I would, you know, I'd. I would look at the access and um, the fact that it is outside the um, settlement boundary with no justifiable need is being a reason for turning the application down. Thank you. OK, uh, I think just to correct you, I don't believe this is four bedroom houses. I think it's two and three bedroom houses. It is, sorry, yes, Chairman. Um, so we have a... Um, a proposal to reject this uh, based on access and being outside the settlement boundary. Uh, we'll work uh, on Chairman, Chairman it's, uh, it's Ben Gard here. You're, uh, yeah. uh, um, I, I just wonder, Chairman, whether it, it might benefit members before we seek a seconder if um, officers uh, articulate those uh, those reasons uh, into a, a reason for refusal that might be supported by a seconder, if that might help the, the committee. OK. Uh, Shall we um, take a 10 minute break uh, to allow officers to, to work on that and then come come back together and everyone can have a comfort break in the meantime? Is everyone happy with that? Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, Chairman, yes, I have to leave for another yes, Chair. meeting. Chair, I have to leave for another meeting. Okay, notice. Thank you. 
Um, is everyone else happy to, to, to uh, take a? Yes, I'm a, happy, Chair. Thank you very much. Then we'll take a take a comfort break. Thank you. Sorry, can I have a quick word with Brian Tyndall, please? It's Councillor Mosdale. Uh, if he's there, sir, you can. No.
Chris? Yes. I've uh, gone to the meeting, give my apologies and come back. And as I did it in the break, I haven't left the meeting. OK, so you're still here. Yeah, I'm still here. But as it was during the break period, I didn't leave the planning committee meeting. Right. I'm still eligible to vote. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Chairman. Uh, Chairman, hi, it's Andrew White here. Can I ask a very quick question, please? Uh, go on then. Uh, I think it's inappropriate that uh, Councillor Morstall was asked to speak to Councillor Tyndall uh, before voting has been allowed to take place. Sorry, all I, the only reason I asked to speak to him was the reason for him meet, leaving the meeting. That was all. So I don't think it was that inappropriate. I just wanted to ask why he was leaving the meeting. That was all. Sorry, I apologise, Andrew, if I've offended you at all. Thanks for the clarification. Sorry, I have, to, I have to agree with Andrew White, to be honest. Yeah, I'm sorry. Members, can I just advise you that um, although the meeting has adjourned, the public can still hear what is being said. Chair, have you seen my comments in the chat box? Just a second. Uh... Uh. Actually, Julia, I tend to agree with you. It's Kenneth Kilpatrick. Yeah, I, I, as soon as I, I, that's what I thought immediately, and I, I feel very, very uncomfortable, extremely. You know, I mean, I, I've been I've been here a long time, Councillor Quirk, and uh, I when I when I when I first came to the Isle of Wight Council, it was in the in the wake of um, uh, issue where uh, I think it was leaders of the council uh, was influencing the, the the planning committee just just by their very presence in the planning committee room, and that was that was a real big massive issue for the Isle of Wight Council. Yeah, it was. I remember it well. Yeah. Craven Court. Yeah, just around the corner from where I live. Yeah. I was also present at that meeting. Thank you, Councillor Joe Evans, for uh, pointing that out. Thank you. Uh, and if and if if this isn't if this isn't addressed properly, I should be putting in the complaint. Well, I have to say I said that it was all right to uh, speak after Councillor Tindall giving his apologies to Lee. Um, I shall go then, if that's what the decision is. Um, I think that might be more appropriate so that we don't get any uh, comeback. Yeah, OK, I fully accept that. Thank, thank you, you very you, much. Uh, thank you for your, your presence today. I mean, it's very difficult having a having a break like this anyway, isn't it? Just before a vote, I just find that's well, a bit strange because you don't know who's phoning who, or you know, I I just find it regular. I guess is the word. Well, we could have sat here twiddling our thumbs for ten minutes, or you could have actually had a comfort break, and it seemed more sensible to have a comfort break. Yeah, we normally have comfort breaks in between the agenda items. That makes more sense, doesn't it? Yes, we're under normal circumstances, but we've got a resolution that isn't a resolution that we need to put into a resolution. Chair, am, am I, I know we're not back in, into the meeting yet, but am I allowed to speak after the uh, the, the committee uh, recommence? Uh, once the committee recommences, we'll have a resolution put and on the floor, so we'll have to vote on that first. Then if that resolution fails, we will have the opportunity to debate again, but if it passes, then we won't. OK, thank you for clarification.
Um, apologies, can, Andrew, apologies can, Andrew Weiss again. Can I ask a very quick question to Marie uh, Barlett, please? Um, Just to let you know that this is, although the meeting has been adjourned, the conversation that is going on in the background is being streamed out live to the public and the press. I think it's inappropriate to have that conversation with Marie in public. I just wanted to ask Marie, uh, is, uh, is um, a full transcript of this meeting being recorded at this moment in time, including uh, the dialogue that has been going on since the adjournment? Yes, yes. Thank you, Marie, that's extremely helpful. Chairman, it's um, Ollie here. I can confirm I'm back. I'm not sure if Ben and Stuart are both back. I'm back, Ollie. We're just waiting for for Ben, Chairman. Okay. Oh yeah, no, Ollie. Oh, yeah, I am here, Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, just a right. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. We've had our ten minutes. Uh, is everyone ready to come back online? Yeah. Yeah. The quirk. Would I be able to ask um, a direct question to uh, Ollie Bolter, please, before we go to a vote? Is that allowed? Is it on a point of order? It is. I want to have a point of clarification regarding a, a potential appeal, please. Yeah, go on. Ask your yes, um, so this is directly to you, Ollie. Um, and I don't know how, how members are going to vote. If if uh, if this if this did go to a appeal, say a members vote against um, the office recommendation and the applicant took it to appeal as is their as is their right would the way that the the, the meeting be con conducted is that to have a bearing on any appeal or is it just purely just on the on the planning um issues thank you thank you um councillor so in terms of the decision uh the decision would be dealt with through the appeal so the planning elements of the decision um what potentially may be more relevant might be the judicial review route because that's the way that the decision was arrived at. Um, so I, I, I have to say I, I don't know. Obviously, I was with officers trying to establish um, some reasons, so I, I, I'm not aware of of what conversation or, or, or what has happened. Um, but the advice from me would be the actual merits of the decision, the planning merits, would be through the planning appeal and any uh, issues around process would be uh, examined through a JR process if that were to uh, be undertaken. Ben may well uh, wish to add to that as well. Uh, nothing to add. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Uh, I, I agree entirely with um, what Mr. Bolter said, the, um, the application in whichever way it's decided, if it's decided that members wished to refuse the decision um, and the reasons for that will be examined by the planning structure. The, uh, the process by which you've come to reach the decision is a matter for the, the administrative court by way of judicial review. So um, what, what I'm uh, what I'm mindful of here, Chairman, is that um, I think one of your, your officers has a has listened to what members have to say and has articulated on the basis of what members have said on the debate for this item um, what as officers understand it to be the reason that uh, members are looking for a proposal to refuse the application and um, you currently have a proposal by Councillor Fuller. I'll ask um, Chairman if you might invite um, your officer, Stuart Van Cornenberg, to read out the reason for refusal, and then Councillor Fuller can consider whether that is his proposal, and then you can look for a seconder chair. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just, just want to say th thank you. That's for the clarification, uh, both of you, regarding the uh, the any appeal. Thank you. Uh, Stuart, could you read out what you've got? Yes, Chairman. 
Um, so having listened to the debate, officers have comprised this reason for refusal, uh, which hopefully reflects members' uh, reasons and concerns, um, and it will read as follows. The application site is located in a less accessible and sustainable location where there is an absence of suitable direct links to local public footway network and public transport links. The proposal would therefore be likely to encourage private car use and deter travel by more sustainable modes of transport and increase the potential for conflict between most motorists and pedestrians to the detriment of highway safety. Furthermore, the development would not meet a local need for housing. The proposal would therefore be contrary to the aims of SP1, SP7, DM2 and DM17 of the Island Plan Core Strategy. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my reading of the, what the Councillor Fuller intended was that it was the actual access to the site as well. Yeah, uh, Councillor Fuller, you can speak for yourself. Yeah, I, th I think the access to the site is quite, oh sorry, I think the access to the site is quite relevant and I was trying to pick up what Councillor Hollis was putting forward in his in his view as well. Um, I think that both Councillor Hollis and myself, I hope, are in agreement with the access to the site being um, being um, not sustainable. Um, Chairman, may I? Uh, no, the, what, what has been read out by um, by the officers is not what I meant. I meant purely on the access to the site. We have in the past turned down planning applications because of, I can remember, a hedge being in the way. Um, I don't know if they won on appeal, but um, uh, uh, but uh, it's purely on access to the site. On, I mean, I would like to go further, but from what Mr. Bolter said about uh, uh, reflections on SP1, uh, I don't think it can go down that route. So it's purely on access to the site and uh, the inadequate pavement, which I think Island Roads uh, um, highlighted, but um, that, that's it. No other reason. So I may not be in agreement with Councillor Fuller. For me, it's just access to the site. Sure. Can you integrate that into your composite agreement? Thank you, Chairman. Um, so that's so. Ultimately, we're saying then that the 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 proposal would have inadequate access yeah. to serve the development. Yeah, and and is is that it? Okay. That's, that's so is that is that acceptable from your side, Councillor yeah, Fuller? It it is. It is, but uh, you know, reading through the report, I had the view that SP1 was a strong argument, would give us greater meat on the bone, if you like, to sustain a refusal for this application. And that is why I've added SP1, because I still think that SP1 still, um, still sits within our island plan. And I think that because it's outside the settlement, um, boundary, there is strong justification to refuse that as well. If Councillor Hollis is with me on that, I am with him on the on the um, access grounds as well. It, it seems sensible to put a composite uh, resolution yeah. in that gives us more, um, more defence if it does go to appeal. So I agree. Um, yeah. and it, uh, can you just incorporate that into the previous one? Yeah, okay. yeah. You need a couple of minutes. Well, yeah. If I may just say, um, there are two minds there. Uh, if I see an officer like Mr. Bolton not nodding his head about SP1, I'd be happy if that was put in. If uh, uh, if he doesn't, I would go on. Um, I go on the just on the access. But um, uh, I think we're in a slight quandary. Well, I'm in a slight quandary now about about SP1, but. Um, Chairman, if, if I may um, interject and, and perhaps give some uh, potentially reassurance to, to members on this point, I think, um, and 
apologies for the um, length of um, the adjournment, uh, but that was reflective of, of the discussion the officers had in, in trying to articulate um, what we understood members' reasons uh, for refusal would be. What I think you'll find is through the uh, reasons that uh, uh, Mr Van Koenenberg has given uh, reflects both of those issues um, and actually uh, picks up on the uh, concerns that members have expressed around the sustainability um, issues as they see them uh, in relation to this proposal. So I would suggest that with the addition um, of the site specific access point that members have requested along with uh, the the draft uh, reason that that Stuart has already given that would address the the points that members have raised. Thank you very much. Uh, Stuart, do you have a set of words now? Um, so, so far I have. Uh, the application site is located out of a defined settlement boundary um, and would have inadequate access contrary to the uh, sustainability aims of policy SP1 of the on plan core strategy. Yeah. yeah. Happy with that. Uh, OK, does anyone want to, to comment on the uh, the resolution? I've got uh, Councillor Price. Um, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, it's just to um, just to absolutely clarify that we are in, in regards to the sustainability of the site that we are talking about the footway that connects the site to the um, sustainable transport links and the local amenities. Chairman, yeah. if I can just come in and explain that the, the reason we had put forward reflects um, the comments made by members around the uh, pedestrian connectivity. Um, it's actually um, very well um, worded compared to Island Road's reason for refusal that was recommended in their comment. So it talks about the fact that the site is in a, in in a less accessible and sustainable location where there are um, uh, less desirable, if you like, or unsuitable um, footway links to public footwork. Uh, to the public footway network and also public transport links. Um, it also talks around the fact that because of that, um, it, it would mean that people living there would more likely use a private car, um, which is against the uh, sort of principles of SP7 uh, and DM17, um, which encourages more sustainable modes of travel, um, hence why that's in the reason for refusal. Um, and, and also reflects the safety concerns that have been discussed um, around a potential conflict between motorists and pedestrians because of that inadequacy in the pedestrian links. Um, so that was the, the thinking behind that reasoning. Now, if the safety concerns are not the focus of this and it's more about the sustainability and the accessibility of the, the location, then we can take that out. And essentially the reason for refusal would simply be would simply read the fact that the site is located in a less accessible and sustainable location where there is an absence of suitable direct links to the local public footway network and public transport links. Therefore, um, the proposal would be contrary to the aims of SP1, SP7 um, and DM17 of the core strategy. Sorry, I, ha I do not have an agreement with that. That was not what I meant. I meant it's, it's the um, it's the safety aspect of the highways. If you have people living in the country, they're going to use a car. So I, I don't go down that route. Um, sorry, if we give the pun. Um, but uh, so I may be at, and if, if Councillor Fuller thinks that is the the the, uh, the, the sole cry or the main criteria, I don't agree. But I think the, the idea the idea is the safety aspect and also uh, the, the relationship to SP1. I agree in field site, etc. outside the development area. I agree with Councillor Hollis. So what Can we some, some, some tell me what the difference between the uh, first application and the second application about uh, accessibility, please? Um, Chairman, if, 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 if you would, so possibly Ollie would like to. If you would like me to come into that. I think what we have 
hear Councillor Kilpatrick is uh, a reflection on the balance uh, that officers have to make in arriving at their recommendation when assessing all the information. And it comes back to a point that has been made actually in relation to both of the applications that members have heard this evening, which is on balance, does the benefit of the proposal outweigh the harm? Now, what I think was arrived at in terms of the first application that was considered by members was that due to the nature of the proposal, uh, the benefits were considered, i.e. the employment provision, the provision of affordable housing, etc., were considered to outweigh some of the issues that were identified in terms of the specific access. However, what, what I've heard from the conversation that members have been having is that actually in terms of the particular application you are considering at the moment is that actually there are differences in those schemes. No two schemes are the same as, as you well know and that in light of that a different conclusion has been arrived at which members and the LPA are, are entitled to do. Um, it, it isn't clear cut or straightforward. I think everyone has to accept that and, and I think that that is why there, there has been the, the, the level of debate and discussion that we have had in relation to this particular application. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Ollie. Uh, we're in this position that we also have uh, a, a resolution put by uh, Councillor Fuller, uh, or we get a composite one. So I don't know if you can agree to a composite one, or we go with Councillor Fuller's resolution. Chairman. Uh, Chairman, um, what what I might suggest, maybe just to help clarify members' thinking on that particular point is is perhaps we could ask uh, Stuart to uh, read to you once again the the, the pro draft proposed reasons for refusal um, to see if they they reflect all the issues that that members have raised now. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Would you read it again? Chris, yes, coming out, coming out, Julie, please. First, she's asking questions. Uh, I'll give her the chance to speak. The rest of the resolution that we're speaking to, you probably start talking about it. it it's it's a question of clarification because because uh, Mr. Mr. Bolter, Ollie's raised quite interesting point following on from Councillor Kilpatrick's question about the sustainability, and so it's, it seems to be between the, the the two applications that it's it's a, it's all down to really the um the affordable housing element. So my question is. With, with say we're going to go 50, 60, 70,000 pounds possibly from this development. What, what, is, what is the current pot of, of affordable housing money the Isle of Wight Council currently has? Because I think this, this is a considerable, uh, considerable um, amount of money that will go towards providing the, house, the other housing that we do need on the island. So I, think, I think we can't ignore, we can't ignore that contribution. Apologies, Chairman. I didn't quite hear you to begin with. Julie, would you like to repeat your question? <clears throat> no, I, I heard Councillor James okay. Evans clearly. I, I didn't hear no. your, your response. Okay. Uh, my response was that uh, theoretically we've put a lot of these conditions on the building sites, but they haven't been delivered by, by and large. That is that is correct. That is the mechanism that we have in place when collecting financial contributions towards affordable housing for a scheme of a certain size, such as this one. So the financial contribution is calculated in accordance with our supplementary planning document, and it is a percentage of a sale value. Um, and obviously, to ensure that we uh, get a a contribution that reflects the sale value, um, it is collected at that point, so it is not in advance. Um, so that that is the process that we go through, and then that that pot is then used uh, by the council uh, to, uh, in line with the reasons for collecting it, towards the delivery of affordable housing on the island. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Horace. 
Yes, please. Can we actually get back to the subject that we're discussing, which is uh, the access uh, of this site and uh, suitability, uh, whether or not it meets SP1 or not? Um, I think that affordable housing is a totally different issue. Um, uh, we're not talking about it. that wasn't our decision. We were we were talking about uh, the wording for this, uh, whether it's acceptable to refuse or give permission to. Can you please not patronise a very, very important question? I don't, Thank you, Councillor Hollis. Patronizing. I just want to get back to the subject. Right, let's, let's, can we get a composite resolution that, that adds your point to that of Councillor Hollis? Uh, Councillor Hollis's point to that of Councillor Fuller? Uh, Stuart, can you. So, can chairman, you, so, you yes, so Chair. So, Chairman, so I, I understand it. Councillor Hollis's concern is about the access, yeah. and Councillor Fuller's is the fact that it's outside a settlement boundary. Yeah. Okay, so what I have worded at this moment in time is the application site is located out of a defined settlement boundary, and the proposal would be served by inadequate access, including inadequate pedestrian access, which would be detrimental to uh, which would be detrimental to highway safety and contrary to the spatial aims of policies SP1 and DM17 of the core strategy. I'm seeing uh, nodding, Chairman, so that so Councillor Fuller uh, agrees. So proposed by Councillor Fuller, seconded by Councillor Hollis. Uh, do we need to dis discuss it any further or can we go to the vote? Right, so. Uh, I actually, I disagree with both of those, but it's not for me to. Uh, I shall uh, do my vote accordingly. Uh, we're all uh, open to vote accordingly, and uh, uh, there may be more than you that votes against this resolution. Uh, so the resolution is uh, put. Um, um, Maria, can you, Maria, can you um, read the names out and? Uh, Chairman, if I can, just before we take the vote, sorry, um, Marie, uh, and this is um, the, um, just for clarification here, you, you, if you vote for this, you're voting for this motion. So members yeah. who, who are voting to support this mo mo motion will vote to refuse planning permission for the reasons that have been identified. If you are voting against this motion, then um, uh, then uh, that is the the motion will then uh, uh, rest. So those when you're asked if you're voting in favour, you're voting in favour of a motion to refuse planning permission for the reasons that have been identified. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. And we'll vote for against or uh, Louise, can you read the names out? I can. Councillor Beston. Four. Councillor Cameron. Four. Councillor Fuller. Four. Councillor Hastings. Four. Councillor Hollis. Four. Councillor Howe. Councillor Howe. Councillor Howe, four. Councillor James Evans. Against. Councillor Kilpatrick. Against. Councillor Tyndall. No, he's gone, hasn't he? Uh, Councillor Price? Four. Councillor Quirk? Against. That's seven, four, and three against. So, uh, planning permission is refused on this one. Uh, we now move on to members' questions. Um, I have one issue to bring up in members' questions, which is uh, the um, petition that's been uh, created relating to the planning application number 20 oblique 01061 oblique FUL at Westridge Farm. Um, the Council's constitution allows for petitions uh, attracting more than two and a half thousand residents to be presented to full council. However, the consultation does not allow petitions which relates to the planning matters to go to full council. Um, I do not see this as setting a precedent 
but I do note that the issue is important and emotive. And as there's no provision in the Council Constitution for petitions relating to planning issues to come uh, to come to full council, it can come to this committee as a one-off. I intend to use my discretion as chair of planning to allow the petition to be presented even though the deadline for comments has passed. The committee will accept delivery of the petition and note receipt. Uh, since any member comments are likely to put them in a position of either supporting or uh, opposing, there will be no discussion of this because it could compromise a uh, member's ability to resolve the issue when it comes to committee. Um, I'd now call on um, the presentation of the uh, petition by the councillor Michael Lilly. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK, thank you. Um, Council, um, uh, Chairman. Chairman. Yes, sorry, as a point of order, I've never ever seen a, pl pl a, a petition for the Planning Committee. The Planning Committee is a quasi-judicial committee and a petition is a form of lobbying. And I wish to have it on register that if this petition is put ahead, I will put a formal complaint uh, uh, about the member because I think this is totally inappropriate. We're talking about a live application and this is not the forum and it is trying to uh, trying to sway the judgment of members of this committee and that is absolutely wrong. I have some sympathy for this view but I have agreed that we will accept the petitions or it's no note it so I uh, Right. Council, we meet, please proceed. Right. In that case, uh, Chairman, I will leave the meeting. Thank you. That's your prerogative. Thank you, Councillor Holly. Thank you, Chair. Um, I received the following letter dated the 29th of November 2020 from Archie Holiday, age nine, requesting I present the petition of online. 4,286 signatures as dated at the 8th of December 2012 requesting Westridge Farm be saved by the refusal of the planning application of Iowa Council Planning Committee to demolish all the farm buildings, Arches home and building 475 houses on the farmland to create Westacre Park. Park. Archie initiated the petition as he wanted to a voice as under the current agricultural tenancy, he and his sister Poppy have a legal right to inherit it and continue farming at Westridge Farm if they wish. This is their human rights. I will now read Archie's letter. Dear Councillor Lily, my name is Archie and I'm nine years old and live at Westridge Farm in Ryde. I want to be a farmer when I grow up like my dad, my granddad and great granddad at Westridge Farm. The landlord and developers want to build all these houses which will ruin Westridge Farm forever. I do not understand why houses can be built on land that is being used. My family have looked after all these fields since 1966 and I do not think they should put houses on here as it would kill all the wildlife trees and hedges that are very old. And what will happen to all our cows? Me and my sister have been worried about what is going to happen. We do not want to leave our house and we love Westridge Farm so much. All my friends love it too when they come and visit, but they haven't been able to come as much because of coronavirus this year. Me and Poppy wanted to help try and stop the planning permission. We have done a petition which now has over 4,000 signatures. Please can you tell the councillors about the petition and let them know that I have a right to be a farmer at Westridge Farm when I grow up. I want to save Westridge Farm for the future. Yours sincerely, Archie Holiday. A few of the comments of the petitioners. 
and there's over 3,000 of them. I will read some of them. I'm signing this because this development is not is not just necessary. Let's preserve our beautiful island for the future generation, not needlessly destroy it. We need to keep the character and beauty of this island, having a working productive farm, which has continued to provide the holiday family with a light livelihood, which is part of their family heritage, is so important to the character of Elmfield and the whole island. Once this island is lost to housing, it can never be regained. The planned development doesn't put people first. It's about profit for developers. Farming is rapidly diminishing on the island. Another comment, we need farms. We need to produce our own food. There is more than enough urbanization on this rural island. I am totally opposed to this development. We need farmers to feed us. We will happen. What will happen to people when there is no food supply? Please not destroy prime farmland. And lastly, a comment. I believe in Archie's cause. Build on unused, not used land. Under the AH tenancy, Poppy and Archie both have a legal right to succession. Archie is keen to take on Westridge Farm one day and will continue the holiday family legacy since 1966 and three generations and safeguard the farmland for the future, the good of future generations of islanders. The farm up until 2007 was selling milk direct to local residents as it had done in the 60s, along with eggs, as well as selling to the National Arla Dairy. The plan for the future is to invest in a pasteuriser and vending machine, enabling the selling of Westridge Farm milk and eggs direct to the local community once again. To enable more educational farm visits for schools and community groups to ensure Westridge Farm remains at the heart of the local community. Westridge Farm is a traditional generational farm that hands down the skill of farming and gardenership of the land and environment. It is a way of island life that connects family and community. Archie is asking you to listen to him and the other petitioners in preserving his human right and the rights of Ride and Isle of Wight residents to preserve this farm to remain providing a local food security for future generations. Archie and Poppy at their age should not at this time of pandemic and the trauma their generation is experienced being worried about whether they will have a home or future in 2021 at Christmas time. Please listen to them and consider their future and the future of the island's environment and farming. Once built on it will be lost forever. Archie's dream will be lost forever. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Uh, we'll note that the, the um, petition has arrived at County Hall, so we've, uh, uh, we have received it, we note it. Um, I wish to propose a, a resolution that we ask the relevant planning officers to consider any material planning considerations raised in the statement that signatures are supporting before coming to a recommendation to be presented to Planning Committee for determination. Can I have a seconder for that, please? Good. Second. So who was that? Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, John Kilpatrick. Uh, so we've um, proposed and seconded. Uh, can we go straight to the vote, please? Uh, Councillor Beston. Uh, four, that's. Councillor Cameron. Four. Councillor Fuller. Four. Councillor Hastings. Four. Councillor Howe. Four. Councillor James Evans. Four. Councillor Kilpatrick. Four. Councillor Price. Four. Councillor Clerk. Four. So that resolution is carried. Are there any other members' questions? I've not been notified of any chairman. Uh, nor have I. Uh, so with that, thank you very much, uh, everybody. Uh, and I'll close the meeting. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Good night.
Bye. Bye. Thanks, members. Thank you, Chair. You handled that well.